Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, Sean Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with the Professor, and we are pleased to be joined by Georgia Talla from the NFL Players Association. We're talking labor. We're talking NFL. And it's hard to believe, George, it's seven years into the collective bargaining agreement. I still remember being down in Atlanta when things started to work out as far as getting a deal done, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of zipped by pretty quickly. It really has. And, um, you know, John, it's always a, a great pleasure for me to chat with you about these issues. And in a blink of an eye, you sort of remember the first time I think you and I met at the Combine when we were approaching at that point um, what was Armageddon in the lockout. And now, you know, here we are with the cap jumping the way it has and um, looking ahead, frankly, to when this deal is going to potentially expire and see what we're going to do between now and then. Yeah. In fact, that's uh, one of the things to really start to get into. I mean, as you look back over the seven years, and obviously the 2001 agreement was a game changer, how do you look back at this and how this uh, has worked out or hasn't worked out so far? Look, there's always uh, things that you can do better. There are always things that you can highlight that you're perfect. I think that when you break down the last seven years, uh, certainly there are no complaints about the way that the you know, what we would consider them the non-economic aspects of this deal have worked out with the uh, limited workout time, you know, reduced uh, off-season workouts, giving players more time to recover, um, limitations on contact. I think you've seen all of that take a really good uh, measure for players in terms of how they recover, uh, how they're able to come back from injuries, how they're able to um, rest in the off season, and frankly, not just for football purposes, but to do other things. I think we've seen a lot more players take advantage of things like postgraduate degrees uh, or finishing their undergraduate degrees than we have uh, ever before. And that's, you know, really a tribute to the way that we have set up the non-economic aspects of, of this collective bargaining agreement. I, I know the one On the thing economic that... side. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, it's good. Talk about the economic side of it. Yeah, on the economic side, we are we are really proud of that as well. I mean, we've seen record cap growth. Uh, as a as a numbers cruncher guy yourself, I know, um, you know, you can appreciate how much the the cap growth has led to increased cash spending. Um, you know, we mandated cash spending. Of course, teams are always going to do what they do to try to get around some of those. Uh, cash spending mechanisms and try to mess with players in their individual contracts. But um, on a very macro level, uh, you know, we can look back and say we have done our job, and that's precisely to create as much money in the marketplace as possible players and agents to take advantage of. Yeah, because, I mean, and this is going to be an interesting year because uh, with some quarterbacks like Matthew Stafford and others starting to come up, it now looks like the quarterback numbers are going to start to go above $25 million a year. The league is on the verge and the players are on the verge of having their first defensive player, maybe Khalil Mack, getting over $20 million a year. And so from the top end of it, the salaries keep going up. And a lot of that's because the cap keeps going up. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really proud of that aspect, frankly. And I think when we came out of the gate in 2011, not everybody understood the revenue sharing aspect of this deal between players and management, and we, which is frankly a revolutionary thing. Um, you know, we are, the, the players are guaranteed to have their side and their shares of revenue increase um, if we grow revenues collectively. So, that's a new feature, not anymore, obviously, because we're, as you mentioned, seven years into it. But that was a new feature that took people a little time to get used to. Uh, and, and it took people a little time to sort of understand and, um, you know, figure out how to take advantage of it. But television contracts have gone up. Revenues have gone up. Sponsorships have gone, have gone up. Uh, and with that, players' shares of revenue have gone up. 
I know just recently uh, you were talking about the idea that uh, the Players Association may start reaching out to the networks because it is starting to get to the point where you have to start planning ahead to see how it's going to be for the next collective bargaining and agreement. I mean, is there concern either by the Players Association or the league that the contracts for TV may have started to max out or are we continuing to see growth past 2021 where the networks can still bring in big money? I do think they'll still bring in big money, but there is and should be a concern for how we're going to move forward beyond 2021. Look, the television contracts expire, I think, just short of the collective bargaining agreement by a year. The broadcast landscape is changing and, and, you know, for, for everybody who's at a major network, um, in, in sports, you know how that's impacted people's lives and people's jobs. And it's going to be a matter of time before we're in a place where it starts impacting the way that the television rights are bought and sold. So um, I don't think that there is reason for alarm per se, but certainly if the team owners and, and particularly the team owners who are on the broadcast committee um, don't start looking at creative ways to extend those deals beyond 2020, uh, that's going to hurt our business. That's going to hurt everybody's uh, bottom line. And to your point about players wanting a seat at the table, that's absolutely going to be the case. We are going to reach out to the networks to try to understand what measures they're taking uh, for the long term. We're going to look at the way that they value television rights uh, for live sports in general, beyond just the NFL. Those are things that uh, we want to be involved with, primarily because we are impacted by them in the way that um, our shares of revenue might go up or go down. As you look back over the seven years, what are the one or two or three things that you and Demora Smith are most proud of with this deal? That's a great question. I think the most underrated aspect of this CBA um, has been the money that's been set aside to help players transition in and out of football. And namely, that is uh, an affiliated organization of the NFLPA is called the trust. The trust was bargained for in 2011 precisely to provide players with a number of services that frankly weren't there before um, for them. That included things like medical coverage. That included things like continuing education for graduate and tuition reimbursement for players. Uh, everything from uh, counseling services and support. All of those things were in place ad hoc. But when you have a, an institution that's funded to the tune of 20 to $25 million every year to do that sort of thing, You know, it really gives you a chance to um, do a lot more and and provide players with a lot more in-depth services. I think that's something that I think we're particularly proud of. And it's not just Dee and myself. I mean, you know, again, I I love to tell people um, who hear our voices most of the time, this is the players. This is is the players' union. Um, We just work here. <laughs> There's some fun things that come out of this too. I know that one of the things that uh, is getting more active is Ace Media because uh, you, you've now got some vehicles there where players can do some television type things. Uh, Miles Garrett, for example, I mean when he was drafted, getting him involved. I'm kind of intrigued by the one where Travis Kelsey's reality dating show. Talk a little yep. bit about what Ace is and what can be looking forward ahead for that. Well, John, I knew you were uh, tuning in to Travis Kelsey's dating show I was, every yeah, week, I was. weren't you? I was, yeah. I was worried he was going to get <laughs> traded, but I, but I, I, I have been going into that, yes. <laughs> Fantasy fans took that one to a whole new level, I think. But um, that, was, that was a great example of how we're trying to provide players through this production company, Ace Media, the opportunity to, to seek out different um, entertainment forums for them to tell their stories or be a part of something different or be a part of something crazy if they want. But uh, Ace Media is designed really to try to break away from the traditional, you know, media mindset that players usually have of, 
oh, I'm just going to be in a locker room and answer a bunch of questions about the game. That stuff is important. That stuff is valuable. That stuff keeps us moving overall as a business, but it does more to highlight the team and the stuff on the field as opposed to a player's interests um, off the field. And so, you know, Ace Media has been around for a couple of years now. You mentioned the stuff that we did around the draft with Miles Garrett. That was another example, frankly, of a player and his family who wanted an alternative draft experience. Ace Media came in and, and offered them some um, different ways to tell their story. And they were still on ESPN that night and, and, and still had the pop of, of having the first round, um, you know, be in their living room, so to speak. Uh, but along with Miles, Charles Harris and, and Malik Cooker had the same opportunities and put a little money in their pocket. Not bad. What are, what type of other ventures involving Ace? Like what type type of shows can be developed like this? Um, and the the possibilities are infinite. So we recently worked with uh, the you know with Warner Brothers and their production of Wonder Woman. Um, I think that a lot of folks who are you know, already in the mainstream and producing these sort of big budget uh, movies for the mainstream are starting to understand the power um, that players have on their own, um, you know, on their own following. So we did a pretty cool thing with the Wonder Woman movie um, and the release that's coming up on that, where they asked us to bring a bunch of players in to tell their stories about who their Wonder Woman is in their lives. Uh, that was another Ace Media production. Um, and it's not just football players, by the way, John. I think, you know, we're heading out to Europe shortly to do uh, a few things with Premier League players uh, over in the U.K., um, along with, with Spotify, So those, you know, which is a, a streaming music company. Um, so all of these things are opportunities that Ace wants to take advantage of, not just for professional football players, but professional athletes worldwide. Let's get into some, some uh, football issues here, some labor issues. First off, on the local scene, it seems like each year Richard Sh- uh, Sherman of the Seahawks is getting more involved with the uh, union and activities. That Where is he kind of rising as far as being a union member? Richard's on our executive committee. So he is one of the um, elite 10 players or 11 players who oversee um, you know, the way the union is run, oversee our strategy and and are really involved with the way that we proceed on on a number of issues that are important to the membership. We are meeting with the executive committee here in mid-June for our annual summer meetings and and along with, you know, Richard, he'll be joined by players like Lorenzo Alexander and Eric Winston, who's our union president, uh, Ryan Wendell and others, uh, to really sit down and, and do a deep assessment of how our union is doing, what direction we want to move forward in, and things that we can improve on. So his voice, as as every football fan knows, is a really crucial voice, um, not just for the business, but for uh, a number of issues that we've got across the league. Uh, He is um, certainly not one to hold his opinions back. No, um, that's true. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But that's why we love him, because he – uh, is really engaged with how we um, should move forward on on issues that he's passionate about. And look, it goes back to the point I made earlier. This is the players' union. Um, I think a lot of people who look at the NFLPA look at the institution as separate from the players who are in the locker room, and, and certainly that's a credit to D and the executive committees who have who have served in that capacity to really – take away that um, misperception. Uh, as, as the week close out, I think there's probably close to 150 draft choices that have now reached agreement. But I know one thing that you keep uh, warning and trying to get alerting to the agents is that language changes has become a big issue and in some cases may slow down some signings. As the money has increased, John, we have seen a number of clubs take a shot or, or make attempts to change the language to limit the amount of money that players can earn. And while over the last six, seven years, we've seen the, the number of guaranteed money 
league-wide rise above 65% for the first time in league history, the clubs are now messing with contract language. And contract language can include everything from uh, offsets to void guarantees. And, and you know from following the Joey Bosa stuff last year, uh, what the Chargers tried to do to him um, to get to get certain contract language in that would void that would avoid it as guarantees. And this year, we're seeing with this particular rookie class, uh, clubs are trying to insert language into contracts that's frankly directly against what is going on. You know what the language exists in the CBA. Uh, they're trying to put language in that they can't put in to 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 players. Um, Things like getting their money taken away if they don't submit to a physical whenever they want. Well, you can't do that because um, the off season is protected by the collective bargaining agreement. So we're working really strong, you know, really strongly and really closely with agents to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, for the most part, it's delayed some contracts from getting signed because we've pushed back against that language. Um, but you know, hopefully, everybody will be tied up here soon. Concussions remain a big topic, uh, and obviously safety being a big topic. How do you feel and how does the union feel about where the league is with concussions and trying to at least prevent as many as they can? We're improving, but we're not all the way there yet. And last year in particular, there were, I think, two cases where the concussion protocol uh, was violated, um, at least in our view, and we had to proceed with an investigation, so to speak, to try to figure out where the protocols were missed and whether or not there was going to be any you know, action taken against the clubs. Um, it's better, John. It really is. But we can't ever be satisfied because this is an issue and an, and an incident that causes and has caused so much pain, not just for players, but their families as well. So to the extent that we can continue to study it, to the extent that we have committed our research dollars out of the 2011 CBA to work with Harvard University to try to see how we can, um, you know, not just treat players who have concussions, but work on ways to prevent them. That's what we're going to dedicate ourselves to. It's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, it gets so many headlines, um, Nowadays, especially, I don't know if I took the words out of your mouth, but with Giselle coming out a couple of days ago and talking about it, too. And then finally, uh, can you give us an update of where uh, the league and the union stands on marijuana use in the future? Yeah, great question. Well, you know, you, you're you're up in the great Northwest where it's uh, socially and legally not such a taboo thing. Um, it's certainly you know, accepted up there in a way that it's not in some other states and across the country. The trend is moving in that direction, but I think our bigger focus is on the way that players um, are using it to potentially manage their own pain. And that's what we have a concern with. So it's not so much, you know, the NFLPA is an advocate for legalization of recreational use, it's more the NFLPA is an advocate for researching cannabis and its medical benefits to try to help professional athletes that, uh, you know, in all sports deal with potential pain management problems that they have. Uh, you know, I think I've talked about, and if I haven't, folks who listen to your podcast should know that we're actively interested in changing the, the drug policies under the CBA, which can happen at any time. Um, you know, we want to talk to the league about taking a less punitive approach to that particular issue because it doesn't make sense to have players miss four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 games a year, um, or even a year rather to, to a substance, um, without focusing on what sort of support or clinical help they need. Well, George, it's been great visiting with you as always. The one thing I am looking forward to is Ace Media trying to pair up with Marshawn Lynch for some reality show. That's the one I think everybody's hey, wanting to see now that he's with the Oakland we Raiders. We'll, we'll call you up for that one. How about that? <laughs> well, yeah, but we, knowing how Marshawn loves to deal with the media, you can call me up, but we're not going to be invited in. So. <laughs> it's all about the action, Marsha boss. All about the. It's exactly right. You took the words out of my mouth again. It's like it's, uh, his tune may change if uh, there is definitely some action involved there. So Absolutely. We'll hey, George, thank you so much. All right, John. We'll talk soon.
That's it for this week's edition of Schooled. Thanks for listening. Class dismissed. Thank you.